Hello, everyone, and welcome to Alta Live. If you are an Alta Live regular, you know that it takes a minute or two for our Alta Live audience to fill into our Zoom room. So while that happens, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all um, and give you kind of the lay of the digital land here. Hello and welcome to Alta Live. I am so happy. My name is Beth Spotswood. I'm Alta Journal's digital editor, and I am so happy to see you um, at today's discussion on the Fresno vibe. Time and time again, we are seeing extraordinary creative work done by artists from or in Fresno. And it kind of has us wondering, it had me wondering what magic is going on in Fresno. Continually, it pops up both in the pages of our magazine. And I'm like, Fr Fresno lately is a vibe. Um, and so I want to learn what magic is going on there and how we can get more of it. Today, we are so excited to welcome Fresno natives, Teresa Flores, Anthony Cody, and Joseph Rios for a conversation with Alta contributor and poet, um, Sarah Borjas. Sarah, who has been a guest on Alta Live before, thank you, Sarah. Her debut collection of poetry, Heart Like a Window, Mouth Like a Cliff, was published in 2019. She was named one of the poets and writers. 2019 debut poets is a 2017 Canto Mundo Fellow and is the recipient of the 2014 Blue Mesa Poetry Prize. Her work can be found in Plowshares, The Rumpus, The Academy of American Poets, Poem A Day, and Offing, among others. She teaches at UC Riverside, lives in LA, and stays forever rooted in Fresno. Today's conversation was inspired by Teresa's beautiful article in the current issue of Ulta. It's work like Teresa's that inspire conversations like today's and allow us the opportunity to dig deeper into such an important topic like recognizing the culturally significant work emerging from Fresno. Before we talk about that work, however, some brief housekeeping. Alta is the digital interview series we do here at Alta Journal. If you're unfamiliar with us, we are an award-winning quarterly magazine and website focused on California and the West. You can join us as a member for as little as $3 a month and support the work we do, including publishing work by writers like Teresa and Sarah and presenting events like this one today. But really, this event is free. We're so happy to welcome you. Um, we're gonna, please use, there's a Q&A button directly below the screen. You can use that to ask questions of our guests. Sarah will lead them in a conversation for about 30 minutes and then invite me back. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can. This event will be recorded and posted to altaonline.com later today. We're also gonna shoot all of you an email with a link to the video as well as links to Teresa and Sarah's previous work in Alta, anything else that comes up, Joseph and Anthony's work. Don't worry, you're going to get a link to all of this. We're taking copious notes while they talk. It's always nice to see where everyone is tuning in from today. Um, so please use the chat to let us know where you're zooming in from. I am in Stinson Beach um, on the west side of Marin County today. Um, and with that, I turn it over to the brilliant Sarah Borjas. Hi everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us uh, for Alta Live. I'm super pumped to be here moderating this conversation. Um, Teresa Flores, um, I'm gonna go ahead and say a little bit what we're doing, introduce everyone and then, and then get going on the conversation. But uh, Teresa Flores uh, wrote an essay as Beth mentioned, that's published in the current edition of Alta um, about her influences uh, in Fresno. Um, if you haven't heard of Fresno, everybody who seems to, to, to read Teresa's essay or hear that um, Fresno is, is a bit of a capital for poetry and for art, as we see, um, is surprised. <laughs> so <laughs> and so um, she writes in uh, her essay, Fresno and its surrounding region in Central California is not a space where art and poetry are meant to thrive. Rather, they are created there in order to ensure survival. Uh, in this essay, she talks about uh, her work starting uh, at the Macy's lingerie floor, <laughs> moving into uh, the study uh, of, of Chicano history, um, muralists, and, and poets. So I want to introduce um, everyone who's joining us today. Again, Teresa Flores is an interdisciplinary artist whose work examines identity wellness and often takes place in the public sphere 
and incorporates civic engagement. Her studio practice includes drawing, painting, and video, and she is currently the official artist in residence for Los Angeles. Uh, Anthony Cody is also joining us today. He's the author of Borderland Apocrypha, winner of the, winner of the 2018 Omnidon Open Book Contest, a 2022 Whiting winner, and a 2021 American Book Award winner, and a 2020 Poets and Writers debut poet. Uh, he is currently working on a manuscript in project, progress called The Rendering um, as the fellow um, for Canto Mundo Guzman Mendoza Paredes Fellowship. And Joseph Rios is the author of Shadow Boxing, Poems and Impersonation. He is from Fresno San Joaquin Valley. He is a recipient of scholarships from Community of Writers Workshop, Canto Mundo. He's a Vona alumnus and a Macondo Fellow. His debut collection was chosen by Claudia Rankin as a finalist for Amnadon's first book prize. He was also named a notable debut poet by Poets and Writers in 2017 and was a finalist for a Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Fellowship. Woo! Okay, so <laughs> I just reading that felt I was surprised about Fresno. <laughs> you know, you, you, it's it's a trip. It's a trip. Um, so I want to go ahead and start off by um, maybe asking Teresa, um, what was it like <laughs> to write this essay and find yourself starting in your art practice, but you know, falling into to poets. It's the conversation, the, the constant conversation. Um, Joe and I are always bouncing off ideas and like telling each other stories. Um, and then that happens again, like with Anthony and then with you and um, that the work is not, I'm not this like individual artist who's just out here coming up with these ideas like, mm -hmm on my own, I'm in conversation with, with other folks. And um, that work doesn't always take on a visual form. It can be written um, and it can be told in, in verbal stories. And um, there was no way to write the article and not really talk about how that conversation happened. Mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of a trip how, um, it's just like, you're constantly learning about things from Fresno. Like before we joined you all live, we were chopping it up with Beth about crazy, crazy. Uh oh, is she frozen? I think Sarah. I, I think Sarah broke the space time continuum. We were talking about Fresno facts. We we're talking about Fresno facts. Are you there, Sarah? Okay. I hear. Okay. I'm back. <laughs> um, but everybody, you know, everyone's surprised, including myself. Um, but. <laughs> What, you know, people always say like, I think the motto for the Fresno State MFA program is like, it's in the water <laughs> or something like that. Um, and I was thinking about like, what are the conditions? Um, Teresa writes in her essay, again, the art and poetry made in and about the region come from a necessity to survive, to shine a light to others like ourselves, announcing that although we may not be clearly visible in the constellation of art, worlds on this planet, we remain present. And so I'm curious for you, like, what do you feel the conditions are of Fresno that help you remain present or that kind of free you up to do what you do um, around there? Who's starting? <laughs> uh, I. <laughs> Um, I, I thought that I, I didn't know if it was for any of us or if it was just yeah, I'm sorry. Person. That's that's for okay. anyone. Anyone. Um, I'll start just a little bit. I think I'm, I'm zooming in from Fresno as well, which is also the traditional uh, lands of the Yokuts and Mono people. Um, and I think one of the things for me when I think about that question is we have so little. So in some ways we have like everything and nothing to lose. And I feel like for me, that's both like, it's like this weird balance of having the ability to risk everything because you also know there's nothing, you can't get any, it can't get any worse, right? Like you can't, can't get any worse than writing a poem for no money when you have <laughs> no money, um, <laughs> when you have bad air, when you, you know, when you're uh, 
an hour from Zoom and your mom's car battery dies and you're like stressed out, you're going to make this Zoom. <laughs> Hi, sorry, mom. Um, <laughs> putting, putting us on blast. I know she's out there in Zoom right now. Um, so I think that's part of it. Like having so, knowing that you have this rich history, right? Like the rich history of your own family, of the people that did come before you, but also knowing that, you know, if you don't, if you don't do anything, no one's going to, no one's going to blink twice or think twice. Right. Mm -hmm. Because that's like the anticipated narrative, mm -hmm. right. To get swallowed up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think that like, that's, that scarcity, right. That's, you know, and not to be a, you know, not to promote scarcity as an educational art practice, like piece, you know what I mean? Like I'd much rather not have it, but like, but, uh, but yeah, that, that, this, that in that scarcity, you kind of um, there's like this in these like sort of, dark neglected places you know you can there's a an in, in, almost like an indignation or like a, a demand to create and own all the tools to control your destiny right because then it's like I feel like for me in, in, in the times where I've I've been in spaces that are uh, either one very white or two they just don't understand what it's like to come from this place um, and there's that imposter syndrome kind of rolls over me you know and and starts to sort of stifle my voice and such. Um, you know, it's it really is that like, I think at the core of that is like the presumption of desperate desperation, right? That that you're desperate to be somewhere else, but friends know, right? You're so desperate to be anywhere other than there. So like you should just do whatever we tell you. And I think in a lot of cases, the opposite is true. It's like with a, a, I think the reason why Fresno artists and poets are are so bold and are you know are seen as so or are seen as such, is because I think at to what Anthony is saying is like, at the core of us is a sense that like we don't need the outside world as much as they think we do, you know uh, we don't need whatever they have to offer as much as they think we do, so we're not as necessarily as desperate as they think we should be, you know, because we're coming from where we are coming from. It's like, no, like we, we've already learned how to survive without you, you know? And if you like anything that we're doing, so what? Like, you know, like, you know, you weren't, where were you when, you know, when my car died or like when I got a flat tire and I didn't have the 200 bucks to change my tire, you know what I mean? Like, you're not going to radically change my life. So I'm not going to give you any of my time, you know? Mm -hmm you know yeah I told I just told that to my father actually there's nothing there's nothing that we ever we're, you know there's nothing that's going to happen it's going to materially change materially change our lives right yeah. as much as that like the perception of like the larger like institution or or literary environment or art or art culture but like the reality is there's very little that will do that right and that's always a struggle at least for me, like I'm thinking about like, how can I do X, Y, Z, but also make sure that there is some material change for, for yeah, like my yeah. family. Cause the last thing I want is to be making things that are like celebrated, but then, you know, all the homies and all the family, like we're still running in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And taking, taking those ideas. And then when I wound up in West LA for grad school at Otis, suddenly I'm present and actually visibly seeing the contrast mm -hmm. and and you know that was where um I really kind of like dug my heels in and knew that like I had I had been through a lot and that what I was seeing was maybe an extension of Hollywood but also that um being in Fresno is not this um unique experience to the universe that a lot of the rest of the country has these experiences and you just don't hear about them and you don't see them. And so actually maybe we are the majority. And so there were times where people approached me and they were like, why are you talking about Fresno in your work? You're in LA now, you need to forget about it. You know, like, like move on from it, things like that. And it was like, well, this is really important. This is really relevant to a lot of what's going on in the country. Mm -hmm. so, um, I think yeah. that's what they that's what they told Phil Levine when he kept writing about Detroit and Fresno right <laughs> just kidding I can see it. I can see it. yeah it's 
I was even joke. I even joke with, uh, I was joking with another poet and I think Anthony too, at some point, uh, but Malcolm friend where I was like, let's just start a Costco poets club. Like we don't care. Like we don't need, <laughs> we don't need these things to keep writing poetry. And if we're not, you know, if it doesn't serve us, like we would love to work at Costco. <laughs> like we, in fact, we're expected to like, in fact, yeah. that sounds like a really good life. Um, and, yeah. and I mean, it starts out at Macy's. Yeah, it starts out at Macy's lingerie department. That's where the essay yeah. starts. Yeah, I mean, Joe, Joe, and I have talked about the dream of of being the Donaghy uh, d- delivery driver. Yeah, that's the, that's the Fresno poet dream. You know, you're delivering the beer. You're delivering. You're, you know, you're getting there. You're rolling out the kegs. You're the life of the party. You know, you got your regulars. You're saying hi. That's the dream. That's the, in some ways that's the dream, right? Wow. <laughs> Shout out to Angel Aguirre, the Donaghy delivery driver that I knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, something else I want to ask about too is like, okay, so once you, once you get, like Joseph said, like the boldness, you know, that no one expects you to do anything. Um, and you don't, you don't, you don't need, you know, you don't need the, the accolades you don't expect. They're really not in like your, um, your paradigm, you know? Like they don't really exist for you. Don't grow up with that as part of your imagination at all. Um, And Teresa says in her essay, um, she talks about making work about home in place and that her adaptations were a mix of rasquache and pocha and they translated into survival and joy. Um, So I'm curious, like thinking about Teresa's uh, combination <laughs> of this like straddling um, of, of perceived borders, you know, and identity and also over survival and joy. Um, you know, what is your work or what do you want people to know about Fresno when you write poems, when you make murals? Um, what do you want to celebrate about Fresno? Or what do you want to clarify about Fresno? I feel like a lot of my work is more like checking and critiquing and clarifying uh, the narrative. Um, so what are those for you all? Uh, I'll go ahead, Teresa. What jumps out at me is the interconnectedness. Like, I mean, you can start by talking about just that literally Fresno, the Central Valley is the bread basket of the country, right? And so all this food leaves the valley and everybody's eating it and they don't know where it's coming from but there's an interconnectedness. And so I see that again with that contrast of being in Southern California. And, um, and then it becomes kind of this uh, distorted image because you only see these corporations that are actually serving the food. You don't know who's making it, what the farms are, what the land is like. Um, so that's, that's something that comes through that I want to talk about in my work a lot is like, I'll find a way to like root it back and talk about Fresno. <laughs> Be, and I will I will talk about the interconnectedness like I'm doing the experimental quesadilla lab in Santa Monica and I get food from the farmer's market there at Virginia Avenue Park to experiment with in the lab and always there's food from the Central Valley there because there's food from the Central Valley at every farmer's market in LA so um so I will I will kind of bring that back up and talk about the interconnectedness of it Yeah, I feel like there's like a, for me, it's um, that internet interconnected is for sure is there, you know, like, you know, I, um, I heard, uh, you know, Ray Leon uh, as a mayor, I don't know if he's still the mayor, but he's a mayor of a small town out here in Fred, near Fresno. And uh, he used to say, you know, Fresno's, he'd be like, no, God, no, Fresno's the middle of everywhere, Holmes, like Fresno's the middle of everywhere, like, because everyone's like, Fresno's in the middle of nowhere. Oh, that's the middle of nowhere, blah, blah, blah. But he's like, no, we're the middle of everywhere, Holmes. Like, and um, and I really feel like, yeah, to what Teresa's saying about that interconnectedness. And I feel like the last sort of the, the, the type of things I've been writing like more lately have like really shrunk down the scope to like a very particular small part of like Fresno County for me. And I still feel like... Um, I still feel like I'm, I'm, I'm talking to, as I talk more about my family and my like, great grandparents and grandparents generation living here in this space, um, I feel like I'm still, 
excavating something that's very sort of general or even universal for like a Chicano experience that I don't think we've even even after you know 40 50 years haven't really heard much about or haven't heard enough about and um and it's and it's California history it's you know quote unquote American history it's all these things about you know fleeing the revolution coming here you know um one of the aspects one of the things I find myself talking about Fresno so much is that like you know we're this haven for so many refugees over the last 150 years you know what I mean like so many peoples have come here be it Armenians or Cambodians or Hmong or you know people fleeing actual like execution you know have found and made home here um and uh and I feel like that's also a part of that interconnectedness right that like these like these sort of global movements of peoples find themselves here and find safety here and for you know maybe others can you know have a better way of describing why that is you know uh but uh but the fact is is that you know we we all know people we all know about the Hmong people we all know about the Armenians we all know about all these things because we grew up and went to high school and middle school and elementary school with either the children or the grandchildren, the people that, that fled persecution, you know? And, uh, and I think that's uh, definitely colors, uh, like how I approach the writing. That's like ensuring that that history, even if it's sort of in the periphery of my own, but that I get an opportunity to mention Armenian movements, or I get to mention Hmong people, or I get to mention Cambodians or Lao people or whatever, because that's, that's also very Fresno, you know? I think, yeah, I think that's important to kind of know that there's that shared kind of always on the run, right? Yeah. We're, we're all here for thinking and running for one reason or another. I even think about my like white grandparents who were like climate change refugees right, from the Dust Bowl, right? So like, there's like even that in that instance, right? And how we find community um, and even for myself and how I've found over the years community with like the like the Hmong community and Hmong writers because you know I was just a halfer who had no a sense of identity in terms of you know I'm too white for I'm too white to be Mexican I'm too I'm too brown to be white so who am I but I think kind of circling back to the question and thinking about like the ideas of rasquache and like art from the outside and making things from the outside and making making your art with like what's often like cast aside or forgotten be it the narratives or the styles or or what have you i i think for me it, it kind of it's been like a slow progression of like inverting it of not of of trying to work against and unlearn that feeling of being like less than of being like the dumb little brother fresno who's always having to look to like new york or la or to san francisco to like think i'm not that right and to be like, no, I'm gonna make my stuff. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work from there. And y'all have to come find me because I'm gonna keep making stuff. <laughs> and I think that's kind of like what's been the driver of like for me always being like the bad student in the back of the class, the one to like stir it up, talk a little shit, um, <laughs> talk a lot of shit. Um, and just kind of just be like a pain, a pain to whatever, just to like sort of disrupt it and sort of turn the tables a little bit. And I think that's kind of like, when I think, when I see the four of us here in this in this Zoom screen, I think that's kind of where we're all going. We're disrupting something. Mm -hmm. um, like all of our, all the lineage has led up to like the four of us right here in this photo or the Zoom, the Zoom screen. Yeah, and you're, I, I hear what you all are saying, about, you know, Teresa too, starting with you like going to LA and everyone's like, okay, like Fresno's over, you know, move on, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, I feel and I feel too similarly like when I left Fresno for grad school it just put it in my perspective more clearly because I never could see it because I was so in it you know to me that was normal I remember when I first heard the word froyo <laughs> it was like I was like what is froyo you know or just like things like that I was like what like um, <laughs> but I realized like I was different for the first time I felt different and a lot of that feeling different what came next was the people apologizing that I was different in the way that I was very uh, Fresno 
Um, and I, you know, as you all, as you all know, um, you know, I've been a writer and bartending for a long time. And every time, you know, someone's like, oh, you're not from here. And I'm like, yeah, I'm from Fresno. And they always apologize. Um, and I was at first, you know, being, being in service industry, I was like, okay, you know, moving along. But after a while, you know, I start to inquire and say, what, what are you apologizing for? Or I would say, oh, like you're from there too. <laughs> and they would say, no. And I would have to say, what do you, well, what, you know, what, what, what experience did you have there? That was so terrible. And I just happened last weekend and they were like, actually nothing at all. I think I'm just being stereotypical. And I was like, cool. That's what I thought too. <laughs> and it's great because I've been like, damn, I'm sorry. And I'm like, it's all right. You know, but I feel like in my poetry, that's exactly what I'm doing is I'm encountering, um, a lot of, um, stereotypes, a lot of assumptions about, uh, the central Valley, which is really rich that folks don't recognize. Yeah. Um, I think, um, there's a lot of other cool stuff happening in Fresno coming out of Fresno. Um, and I was curious to ask you all, and Teresa, you had mentioned this in your essay that, um, you know, it's hard to get your work out of the Valley if it's stuck on a wall when you're talking about muralism. Uh, but a poem can travel. So I'm curious, like, where are you seeing art travel lately? Either in Fresno, around Fresno, out of Fresno. Um, and maybe Anthony, you can start with talking about um, the exhibit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, where are we going with this question? Um, got it, got it. Um, yeah, I think for me, there is that definite, like, it can be really hard, suddenly become Fresno famous, right? And suddenly you're like hyped of, I'm here, right? And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly then what, right? You get like drunk, you're like lost in your own sauce. And, <laughs> but I think about it in terms of like thinking about art and like the ramifications of like what is perceived as like Fresno and what isn't. So like, I've been working with like Juan Felipe pretty closely over the last five years. And for those of you joining late, Juan Felipe is uh, born in Fresno County, Fowler, California, and was the poet lord of the United States, previously the poet lord of California. Um, and he has had a rich career, a rich career of poetry and like performance and community building. But one of the things that hasn't actually been celebrated or understood is he's also very much a visual artist. And so during the pandemic, I was working on a republication of one of his earlier works, a, retrans a republication, a translation, a retranslation, a acrylica. And in going through his archive, he and I found like between like 200 and 250 pieces of art that he has made and just some of it in the last like five years, some of it, I'm, I'm talking like proficient and prolific. Um, and so what that's led to is also me thinking about how can we put our art, our poems out into the world? So I actually had an exhibit um, earlier in the year in San Francisco around some of my larger scale poems or my uh, just big, large poem murals, soundscapes, that sort of thing. But right now in uh, at the museum, the Monterey Museum of Art in Monterey, California, there is an exhibit with that's featuring Juan Felipe and his work from, I would say, as early as like the late, late 90s to current time. So that kind of thing, trying to take out and sort of like even someone as established as him of trying to push that perception of who and what are we making from Fresno? Because it's true, it's so hard to like break through in those gallery spaces, which is why I'm always excited when I see, uh, you know, Fool's Gone Wild or somebody like just hyping up Teresa and like, you know, that opportunity to get that reach, to get that kind of people seeing that your art and how you're transforming, you know, transforming things. So it's exciting. All right, I'll jump in. You wanna, <laughs> okay, I thought you were gonna say something. So no, like, I was gonna actually ask if you would, uh, yeah, chat maybe about the uh, Gesseria Lab and anything else that you see happening. Yeah, um, so I had mentioned it earlier. I mean, the Quesadilla Lab, it, it's it's kind of in a way like these idea of like locally sourced quesadillas. Like I, I pop up in a spot and I look at what's around in the neighborhood there and I get the cheeses and the tortillas and anything else that's available. And, and that's a unique combination to that neighborhood. 
and it tells you a lot about the food accessibility there in the neighborhood. And you learn a lot about the people that are living in the neighborhood. They're just alone by the cheeses and the tortillas that are and are not available. Um, so um, what we do with the lab is we experiment with them. We talk about, are you gluten-free? Are you lactose intolerant? Because that affects the way that you eat. And then we ask people to make a quesadilla and then you share it with people. And you kind of like learn about the other person and your neighbors through the way that they eat. Um, and by doing this in public and kind of like shaking it up um, and looking at what's around you and what your neighbors are eating, then you can go back home and reimagine what's in the kitchen there, hopefully. Or you talk to a friend or somebody, you tell them what you did, and then they reimagine too. And so um, it, what it is, it's, it's really meant to be like this community imagining space and like reimagining what's available in your community um, and, and what you can do, like the possibilities for yourself. Um, so... <laughs> I don't know whether to tell me, <laughs> tell me more here. Oh, you put the link in, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a website, experimentalquesadillalab.com, but that's a way of like moving the art, you know, like you can, you can make the art out there in public and then you take it back home and then it redistributes. And it's, it, you know, cooking is an art and it is a way of expressing yourself as well. So that's where I am in this idea of like social practice and art. Um, and that's what I enjoy doing as part of my work. Like I like drawing and painting on my own, but I really like being able to like make these spaces in public for people to use their imaginations and then like go off and do it on their own. I feel like that's really um, something that can, can spark and plant some seeds for future, for the future. Yeah, as far as traveling, I'll just say one thing left to travel. Um, I see Beth jumping on in a sec, but just say one thing to the point of poems traveling is, um, you know, for me, one of, I don't know if someone else has the same feeling, but one of the, the main feelings that has kept with me since the book came out almost four or five years ago now um, is that uh, in the instances where the book is, you know, sitting on some shelf somewhere in like, Europe or some other country outside the United States or in libraries at universities all over the country and I'm sort of come over with the fact that like um that my grandma's stories are there you know what I mean that like and then you know and you guys have had poems and poem of day you know and when that goes out to the world and 200,000 people read that thing uh every morning um you know, I wrote about Henry's Bar, which is this little tiny bar in, in Clovis, right? And it's like, and there was people writing me from like Brazil and like Chile and like talking about how Henry's Bar reminded them of their place, some place, you know what I mean? And it's like this little tiny place uh, in, uh, in Clovis, right? And it's like my grandma's stories where she maybe never really traveled much outside of the two, three mile neighborhood her her very her stories are literally available all over the country you know that somebody can find them you know and hear her voice or hear about her neighborhood or hear about the neighborhood we grew up in and hear about my family and to me that feels like the uh to the point of traveling poems i feel like that's when i start feeling more like a sort of steward of the story you know what i mean like that this is just my role you know, in my life to be the person in between carrying the story to the next, the next place, you know, and, um, and yeah, and, uh, and I just feel like that in those instances, it's just wherever my grandma couldn't go there, at least her story is going there now, you know. Yeah. Wonderful. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and pass it to Beth. I'm going to dive in with questions from our audience. Um, we're getting a bunch of them actually via Slack, chat, Q&A here. Um, David asks, Sarah's mention of people she encounters apologizing for her being from Fresno. Do you think that apology has roots in a racial perception of Fresno in the Central Valley? Rural, yes. Poor, yes. But also Mexican. Sarah, I guess that one's for you. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hard yes david it's a hard, yeah david thank yeah. you for, for asking a, that's a hard yes yeah. and especially yeah, it's a hard yes mexican 
Um, it's mm -hmm. Punjabi, it's Armenian, it's Hmong, it's Cambodian. And this is what Joseph mentioned, all the folks who have fleed, you know, have refugees who could only find work in farm work, you know, and it drives me crazy. Like um, everybody eating, you know, I've worked in like high end restaurants, like really for most of my life, my adult life. And to see, like, to know where that food comes from, the six shifts I work a week, you know, mostly is such a trip. I'm like, no one knows, but I know. And so when they, that apology, that apology comes in, it pierces from that restaurant all the way down to that person who just landed, um, you yeah. know, and uh, it's, yeah, it's absolutely uh, rooted in, um, you know, I think ultimately white supremacy. Yeah. Yeah, Anthony, I, I got that all the time. Him. I got that all the time when I was living in New York. People were like, "Oh, Anthony, you've adjusted really well to Fres from Fresno." <laughs> and I was like, "Fuck, man, y'all have million dollar grants here." You know, two weeks ago, I'd be happy if you know I found like two extra tortillas underneath one of my tacos. You know, so like it's like I don't the like I don't even you know some of that like that racism is like is it, or classism it's classism and racism right like it's those two elements of like ooh, like they've they've like embraced the privilege <laughs> to the point of like oh mijo we're so sorry that you're from fresno but you're doing so well here and it's like no nah, this is this is a piece of cake i you know i got a coffee i got a chocolate croissant and i walked to work today chill out this is life is good here in New York I, don't, I can do this with you know one hand tied behind my back because I've done it with two hands tied behind my back and if you know if, so it's like so when those apologies come I'm just like uh, you should be sorry for yourself it's true I, I see it too with um because when I hear it from like other Latinos that's when it's like whoa there's a lot of classism going on here like you're looking at your your farm worker cousins and yeah. you're looking down on them you know and then it's like tell me more about what you think of people who live far away from you maybe on the other side of the planet or in another country you know tell me more because just by the way that they talk about Fresno says everything you really need to know it's interesting to notice how both in our discussion before we went live and then during the, you know, serious conversation here, how much humor um, you have and, and you don't seem particularly angry, I guess, that, that about the misconceptions, about the, the rude, insensitive, racist, classist, whatever ways people are looking at. There's definitely the anger. Program. There's definitely <laughs> anger. Okay. Because yeah. you seem really there's, like there's, laid there's, back uh... and funny about it all. <laughs> the humor is so you're within a stabbing distance <laughs> of me. So once you're in it. Yeah. It's I mean, funny. you like, you, you, you scratch a comedian and there's like a lot of rage underneath there, man. There's a lot of rage. Uh. <laughs> it's, it's, it's there's so much <laughs> there is a lot of anger in fact i've talked to juan felipe about this because we had this long conversation and i had this and even with my partner too my partner i should say you know part of the all lineage you know in the other room is my partner my longtime partner my derving who was just a finalist for the pulitzer and it's like jesus christ what are we doing with our lives here in fresno um but um I said, I, you know, I don't want to write happy poems, Juan Felipe. And, you know, I just, there's so much darkness. And all he said to me, and this was in the middle of the parking lot, he said, Anthony, the darkness is infinite. And I was like, Jesus Christ, here we go. Man, so, like, you know, some, so like, you know, so like, he's got some bangers, man. Well, he's always got those bangers. Yeah. And this was like, you know, in the middle of summer, it was like three, four summers ago. It was like 115 in Fresno. I'm like standing out of his busted pickup truck and it's like, geez, he's right. And so that's, I think, in a way, like, like, you know, it's that constant battle of like the weight and heaviness and like trying to like shine light back into the world as like artists and like creators to want to like, we, how do we shine the light, but also make sure we have some sort of levity in our life so it doesn't like consume us. So that's kind of that, that like, that push and pull of being like, of having that humor but also having that anger underneath it, like trying to make sure we don't. All four of you seem to have it though. It's, it's, it seems pretty consistent. <laughs> it's lovely, you know? 
we I feel like we do find it in each other and like it resonates there you know and that that helps with the thriving you know I don't know yeah can you yes, talk four, four oh. crushed souls <laughs> <laughs> that should have been the title alt alive four crushed souls. <laughs> can you talk a little bit about the community that is formed between kind of like the artistic writer poetic community that that seems to exist among fresno based or or originated writers because you guys you, you seem to know each other and connect with each other and know a lot about everyone who's working in fresno how does that happen I, mean, I just i don't know how everyone else feels but i've always felt like an ambassador like even when i'm not in fresno or i lived in the bay for five years lived in la for five years and um i just always feel like i have to like you know talk about um, every single it's always on on my tongue is like this elevator pitch you know like these are these are the five poets that we've had who <laughs> either like are, are artists who are like won the pulitzer were the poet laureate or on the cover of this magazine were you know the one one of them we haven't mentioned you know brian turner uh we just rewatched the hurt locker last night it's like the title of that poem, that movie, it comes from a poem by Brian Turner from Fresno. Um, and and uh, so like, there's just, we're everywhere, you know what I mean? So and I always feel like, I'm like, someone, if someone makes a mistake and asks me about Fresno, they're gonna get like a flurry <laughs> of <laughs> like a two minute, like just blast of like, you know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Got the accidental, like, or two minutes or screen. two hours two minutes or two hours you, you know depending on you know how much energy i have <laughs> thank you I, I feel like it's so fresno is the fifth largest city in california a lot of people don't realize that like it feels like a small town but it, it's it's pretty big um but at the same time there's only so many people that are writing and making art and things like that so you kind of run into each other and the thing is when you meet somebody new in Fresno who's making art and doing poetry and whatever, you need to understand that you're gonna know that person for the rest of your life, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like you are now like in it together probably forever. And so I feel like we kind of carry that understanding of being in it, in it together. Um, and yeah, I, I, I like that about that, about the community. I don't know if somebody else say something. Yeah. No, I think that's true. I think it. I think it's true in the sense that because we are, you know, it's it's such like we need each other, you know, like our like you know, like our futures are bound to each other, right? Yeah. Like in so many ways, like I like I need you, you need me. We need to like do this because we're not, you know, there's because there's no money, there's no there's no like there's no like large foundation ready to just give a pool of money to like Fresno. You know, I won't I won't say anything about the Fresno Arts Council because that's a different conversation. Um, <laughs> so like, you know, things like that, right? Like how how do we support each other? We support each other. Literally, we support each other. We show up, we preach each other's work, we we sh we share the poems. Um, that kind you know what I mean? Like we we have to do that. And like also that other fear of how easy it is for whiteness to just wash over it all. We talk about Levine, we talk about Levis, mm -hmm. we don't talk about Luis Marcelinus, we don't talk about Ernesto Trejo, we don't talk about Andres Montoya. You know, it go, you know, for every, you know, for every one white man, there's like five people of color who have historically been here making work. So like once this starts, once someone asks, the floodgates open because we've been wanting to talk about these four other poets who no one ever wants to talk about. Um, Heck, I, David St. John and I had this conversation like a month ago, <laughs> and it was like, yeah, how, you know, Soto, you know, how's Gary doing? Is anyone talking, you know, that kind of thing, you're like, mm -hmm. geez, you know, like it can just, you open a door and a, a Fresno poet or a Fresno writer or a Fresno artist will pop out, and they've just been making and making and making, and, mm -hmm. you know, regardless of if that light shines on them or not, and that's always the important thing, so we're just always trying to help. Mm -hmm. I have to say for um, the first time, Fresno is going to have money flow, flowing into the arts starting, I believe in the fall or next year. Yeah, um, there's measure P, it got passed. And so some of, the, some of the money has to go to like art and public art institutions, but you know, it's yet to be seen who gets the money and where it gets directed to, but it's gonna be, it's, it's there. <laughs> 
we'll see. Um, I, as we as we run out of time, I want to. It's, it's a kind of a, a large question, but hopefully you can each kind of hit on it quickly. Um, Lisa asks, "How was being born and or raised, I guess, in Fresno informed your own identity and career choices as writers, artists, teachers, and mentors too?" So I guess in what sense has, has Fresno, being from Fresno, put you on a specific the path that you're on? Um, we can, we'll go in and what looks like a circle to me and start with you, Teresa. Okay. Um, I feel like this might be sounding weird to say, but it feel like, feels like I have a more global perspective being from Fresno in that um, I was born in the Inland Empire, which is also agricultural and rural. Um, and then now I, I live in Los Angeles, this huge, huge city. Um, but I know that there are bubbles in this world and I've seen the different bubbles in LA and um, I can see that being in Fresno and, and the different parts of Fresno are very much connected to how the rest of the country is and maybe even parts of the world. Um, so with that, when I'm doing my work, I feel like I'm not necessarily like just speaking to one person or this very small group of people that this is something that can relate outwardly. So, Sarah? Yeah, I feel like a little bit, um, like I'm, like I said earlier, clarifying the narrative. And I do feel a, a responsibility to let people know um, what kind of people live in Fresno, you know, and not just the people, not people that just you know, grow your fruit and pick it, but the people like each other in the Zoom that like help you through personal hardships, like Joseph, like helps me move, you know, Teresa consoles me, like the artist community, we work together in art, but there's something about being working class and from that, that you don't just look at each other out for each other in art, you look out for each other in life materially. And I want people to know and to respect, <laughs> respect the, you know, that type of um, like generosity and the type of dignity we regard each other with. And, and my hope is that my work will garner that, that dignity um, for people who don't, don't get to see it, you know, who don't get to experience it. Anthony? Yeah, I I, oh, oh, sorry, God, Joseph, yeah. no, Joseph, we'll dive to you. We'll go reverse. Yeah, that. I just, uh, I, because I, you know, I was just, uh, a guy that at least Teresa and, and Sarah know, uh, our friend Luis Guizar is a filmmaker from LA. He came to visit this past weekend and and we were having this conversation and um, about it. And it's like, just about sort of a lot of what we're saying here, you know, he was getting on too, was just that like at the base level, back to the point about scarcity is like, no one's coming to save us. You know what I mean? Like, so you have to like be able to handle everything so and I feel like as far as like the experience here is like thinking about career or skill sets or everything like that like I've always been a dude and who can like fix a car or fix a house do plumbing do electrical do all these things right uh drive a truck hitch a trailer whatever you know because no one's coming to help like no one's showing up like you have to be able to do it on your own or or otherwise suffer without it you know and and um and I feel like what Sarah was saying is just like, you know, yeah, like, you know, going to pick up a trailer or, you know, getting the dolly and rolling over some stuff like those are elements of like, you know, the art community, I think that I have experienced personally and seen with, um, you know, in different, different facets that I think is, is, a is very prevalent in, in at least in Fresno of like being like, um, support and community art is doesn't always mean you're sitting down and like doing watercolors together you know what i mean like it, it's it, it could be a lot of other a lot of other things it could be like helping someone hang a ceiling fan or build ikea crap or like or just talking on the phone and crying and like you know or like making a meal and sharing a meal together like there's just all these aspects that that all these needs that we have like you know just being means of like feeling less alone as an artist in a place that in a place and sometimes outside places that wants you to feel alone you know what i mean uh and you can feel less alone amongst you know people like anthony Teresa, sarah and others and some of the folks that are in the chat um 
that are from here you know it's just uh i feel like that's where i don't know i guess that 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 there's no way i can say that doesn't influence or keep me in the game you know what i mean like keep me wanting to come back to this when when there's so many factors saying that i shouldn't you know and it's like the the people like these that you know bring me back to the table you know Anthony, you get the last word. Uh, I think I agree. I, you know, I disagree. No, um, I, I, I think, I think Joseph's on to something because when I was thinking about the question, the first thing I think of is what does what has Fresno done to me? Is <laughs> I do too much. I literally, I, I do I, anything and, and and everything. I've either tried to learn it uh, or figure out how to do it myself or ask or or like let or or leaned on someone to help make it happen you know i worked in city government for years um getting my soul slowly sucked out of me but i made friends and homies who could like do stuff but like i built with a friend an entire stage for the tower theater for uh the Mong american anthology that we launched 10 years ago and he had no idea what even we were doing. It could have been for, could have been for anything. He was like, I'm down. You're down for it. So I have to be down. And that's perpetually it. Like to be from Fresno is you have to be, is like, you just have to be down and you just don't quit. And you just keep going stupidly, <laughs> foolishly, or because it brings you joy or it brings you anger. Right. And I know that I do too much, but I just, I can't stop. And I don't stop. <laughs> I can't stop, won't stop. Right. And I just, you just keep going. And there's a point when we do lean on our elders for that knowledge, like someone like Juan Felipe, or we lean on our peers and colleagues, like, like the, like all three of us or four of us here. Right. Because we have to keep going and there's going to be a new fight tomorrow. And there's going to be a new thing we have to make tomorrow. And we're going to have nothing to make it with. Um, so I appreciate that. I think about that a lot. And I, I don't know if I'll, you know, slow down, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, but I just keep going and that's just what I have to do. Um, and know that there's going to be other people behind me. There's going to be another, there's going to be another, there, you know, there's, there, you know, there's 20 somethings that are doing this too, you know, and I, I know that it's our job to help them too. And in a way that maybe that wasn't there for the generation above us. Right. Um, because now we have more opportunity. We have, you know, for lack of a better reality, we do have institutional power now. And how do we open those doors? How do we take the doors off those hinges? How do we make sure the people that are in power here in Fresno, here in California, here in the United States, kind of we tear those doors off, we tear down the building, and we make some cool Rasquatcha shit. <laughs> I, Vicky says, I like this tourism campaign. Um, I, I cannot thank the four of you enough for this. Um, this is so fantastic, especially Sarah for, for doing so much labor and putting together the moderating of this event. Um, and Teresa for your beautiful work, for Joseph and Anthony for joining us. And we, Angel for his for the for the memes, for their memes. Oh, the memes. The were memes. Fire. Those weren't us. That was all Angel. The memes Shout were amazing. Them. Everyone at Alta was like, uh, the, these graphics are hilarious. Um mean God, mean God, man. I'm telling you, the best poetry <laughs> memes out there. If you haven't seen them online, visit our um, Instagram. We've we've reshared them. I would love to have all four of these guests back for another conversation on weird Fresno facts, which we had been discussing earlier. I didn't realize that the guy from In the Heat of the Night was the mayor of Fresno and chose inexplicably and unilaterally to give the key to the city to Billy Ray Cyrus. There are just a number of odd things that I learned just in practicing for this that I feel need to be brought to light about Fresno. Um, far less importantly, however, than it's art and poetry. I am so, again, just so grateful and to our awesome crowd for coming today um, and being so involved and such a part of it. Before you go, there is no Alta Live next week. We are on hiatus, but we will be back on June 22nd with a Summer Reads Roundtable. Independent booksellers will join us um, to share their picks in a variety of, in a variety of categories for what you should be reading this summer. Um, again, this is recorded, will be posted to altaonline.com later today. And with much gratitude, I leave you at that. Thank you, everyone.